Recording has begun. I guess that's the cue to start, I believe. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing more students should be joining, hopefully soon. I hope they have not dropped out of the class already. <laughs> okay, so um, so I'm Amay Bandurkar. I'm an assistant professor in the electrical engineering department. Um, I started uh, last year in January, so pretty new. And this is, as I was just mentioning earlier, this is the my first class in person, so I'm excited. And I hope you guys are as well. Um, okay, so uh, just to give a, a brief uh, overview of like you know what um, my lab does um, and what uh, kind of expertise we have, and then I, what I'll do is I'll quickly go around the class just so like like you know you guys can give like a short one sentence introduction of which department you are from um, and what are you like you know what motivated you to take this class because that kind of will help me. Like you know, modulate my class uh, class slides to ensure that everybody has something exciting uh, to learn. Okay, so um, briefly, uh, my research lab, uh, my research work can be classified into two aspects: uh, uh, sensors and energy uh, sources for various tissue integrated applications. So it could be wearables, implantables, um, and we are also uh, now uh, entering into. Uh, fields of like three D uh, tissues and organoids. Uh, so as you can see, like you know, some of the variable sweat sensors that we have developed. Um, also, these are like some brain implantable sensors uh, and optogenetics. So this single system can do simultaneous uh, neurochemical sensing in live, freely moving animals. Um, at the same time, use light to um, activate certain parts of the brain. So you can do both stimulation as well as sensing using this. Uh, completely subdermally uh, implanted system. So this is the system, and this goes inside the animal, um, and it is a completely wireless system. On the energy applications, we are focused more on how we can make these uh, energy sources more biocompatible. Uh, so in the case of wearables, this was like uh, published like two years ago, uh, where we developed these sweat-activated batteries, uh, where the person's own sweat acts as the electrolyte uh, so in that case, the one of the most toxic component of a battery is the electrolyte, right? So here we basically just use the person's sweat, so which is like the most biocompatible fluid for a given person. You wouldn't want to use one person's sweat to the other. <laughs> so uh, and now we are like you know pushing the limits of these. So these were like wearable ones, and now we are we are developing a completely biodegradable battery for various implantable applications. Um, uh, so. This is something that uh, hopefully in in the next couple of months we'll be able to wrap this paper up um, and and hopefully publish it. Okay, so um, this was just a, a quick overview, and maybe like you know, each one of you can give us a, give us a brief introduction. So who wants to start first? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Interestingly, I came to, so this is my second year uh, at uh, NCSU, and when I came as a PhD, my mind was, um, I had a disposition towards energy harvesting uh, electronic textiles, but uh, but as I did my uh, literature review, I got an interest in sensors, so uh, that is one of the reasons I wanted to take this course. Cool. So, um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Sassy Kalini Kaviruki. I am also come from uh, Wellesley uh, Wellesley College of Textiles. I'm a PhD student um, as well, and then um, my interest in that research is to build a um, monitoring sensor for uh, blood volume inside um, blood re uh, artificial vessels. That's why I'm taking this course, and hopefully it's helpful for my future research. Okay, great. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Research aspect of this class, but I'm curious about uh, different hardware aspects of of uh, the CPE field. Uh, that's why I was interested in the, the sensor uh, facet of hardware. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Jarni. I'm a master's student. I'm in the EC department, 
and uh, I took a wearable census course last semester and I found it interesting. I'm more into the nanofabrication part of electrical engineering, so I think that's why I took this course. I thought it would be more interesting to know more and more how it, how it is getting integrated, like how those two fields are like integrating mm -hmm. into each other. So. Okay. Okay. Very good. Second year, um, I'm in uh, Dr. Michael Danielle's uh, biointerface group. Um, so that's everything we do is <laughs> sensors related. That's what I that's, uh, I actively work on sensors um, in the ESA Center. Um, so that's why I'm in this class. Okay, great. So we have a good mixture of uh, people who have pr some uh, prior hands-on experience in sensors and some who have no experience. So that's that's great. Um, and like you know. Um, the field of these sensors, forget the nano micro part, just the part of sensors is like so broad, there are so many fields that combine. Uh, so it will be extremely difficult to cover everything. So we, what we'll do is we'll focus on like, you know, narrow aspects, which will give you at least a brief idea of like, you know, what are the possibilities out there. So all the systems that I've shown over here, right? Um, like it, it, it includes material science, it includes chemistry, it includes a lot of fabrication, electronics and then ultimately like you know if you're going to be using it for biomedical applications be it on humans or inside the animals or be it like a handheld device a lot of uh, like you know, conditions are imposed by biology also on these sensors so how do we basically bring all of these fields together to develop the platform right so fr from an electronics point of view maybe like you know the electrical engineer might say oh i can develop the electronics but the person who actually develops the, the different chemicals that make it selective to a particular chemical, uh, particular chemical, that person may say, like, oh, it is not possible at all. I mean, you may make the best electronics, but the, there is no chemistry that can help me design the, like, you know, the active components of, of these sensors. So then the, the two of uh, like the, 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 these people, they have to talk to each other. They have to understand what the limitations are in one, one and the other field. And then somehow bring up a some solution that can like you know uh, engineer their way out of the, the problem. So this is basically what what we'll be like you know discussing in, in, in this class. So basically, like you know, as I mentioned, like you know, the deliverables will be fundamental as, uh, understanding of key sensing technologies, um, like you know, how do basic sensors work, uh, what are the requirements, uh, then learn how nano micro materials can be used for developing advanced sensors. Um, and then uh, leverage these, like, you know, whatever concepts that you have learned uh, for developing a sensor of your own, which will be, like, you know, part of your final, you know, uh, project. Um, so what are the expectations? Ask questions, <laughs> okay? And participate in discussions. Um, you don't worry about whether, like, you know, the answers that you're giving or the questions you're, you're asking, uh, are they going to be, like, you know, good questions or good answers? Don't worry about that, you know? Like I have been working in sensors for more than 10 years and I still don't know a lot of things. I still ask questions. So it's better to ask as many questions as possible and participate in discussions. Like, you know, if you think that, okay, this is something that like, you know, could be a potential uh, solution to the problem that we are discussing, just, just, just say it because that, that's important. Participation is important because that's when I know that you guys are actually paying attention and not falling asleep. <laughs> and finally, don't be stressed. Okay, uh, learn, learn, uh, enjoy and like, you know, uh, what, what we are learning. Um, and uh, hopefully at the end of the class, uh, like the course, you'll, you'll be able to know at least the ABC of, of sensors. Okay, this is a question that, you know, technicalities people always ask. How is the grading going to be? Um, so we'll have some quizzes and reading assignments. Uh, I don't like to make it like very uh, homework heavy. So maybe like, you know, two to three homework at max, not more than that. Um, and then final project, which will be like a five page uh, project proposal. Um, and then presentation, a 15 minute presentation. Um, and then um, additional points for active participation. Um, and um, so again, when it comes to homework um, and even the final project, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Uh, I mean, last time I even like, you know, uh, made it a, uh, like you know, a, a option for students to resubmit their homework. So I, I I grade them, then I give some like you know points like hey these are things that you could improve on, 
And if you feel that you want to improve on, you still have that opportunity. Like, you know, in one week or so, you can adjust those comments and then resubmit your homework again. Okay, so, but the maximum that you can gain after, during the resubmission is, is maximum is like 10 points. You, you cannot go beyond that. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, let, let's, let's, Start with like you know uh, discussions on like you know what are the broad applications of sensors like you know what are the different fields that like you know um, you feel sensors are are useful. I'm pretty sure each and every one of you, from the moment you woke up and up until now, you have interfaced with some or the other form of sensors, right? Some of them are very obvious, some of them are not so obvious. So let, let, what are the broad categories where you know sensors may be of use? Medical field. Medical field. Not essentially medical, but you know, counting steps, uh, That would be in in medical, right? Uh, so let, let's okay, let's let's write things based on medical. Okay. W what else? Environmental. Okay, environmental or pollution or whatever. Okay. Environment, whatever. Okay. What else? Yeah, some, some sort of like consumer electronics. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure if it was yes, the yeah. medical, but you know, you have these uh, performance analysis for sports athletes, you have these sensors there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of that can can kind of like you know say bio, you know. Uh, well, I shouldn't say bio, but um, um, I mean, it kind of is like in in the subset of this, right? Yeah. Anything else? I mean, you can get into like you know, like manufacturing plants have you know all sorts of different. Systems. Yeah, industries. A lot of industries. Okay, that's good. Anything else? You know, uh, I, I'll give you some hints. Okay, um, you know, Elon Musk is really famous for, you know, a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Space exploration, you would need sensors for, for those kind of like, you know, emerging applications, right? Because that's one of the fields that the field of sensors has not really, uh, like, you know, applied itself to. It's only now like, oh, how do we make sensors work for these really, like, you know, uh, unprecedented applications, right? So um, something like space exploration or just space. Uh, what about um, defense? A lot of sensors are required for defense applications as well. You would want to have them distributed as specific strategically important locations. For remote, uh, like you know, uh, understanding of where your uh, you know enemy is, what they are doing, and all these things for defense applications, um, and also like finally something that practically a lot of the people we just miss out is uh, infrastructure, which kind of like in, in industry infrastructure applications. Um, you know, uh, they they talk about how the uh, U.S.'s infrastructure is co collapsing. It's it, all of these things, right? So you would want to have sensors to monitor them on a regular basis. So all of these, like, you know, um, later on I'll go on in some examples where the same sensor, you know, depending on what kind of applications you're looking for, there are different conditions that are imposed on it. So that basically means you have to design the sensor, even if it is for the same, you know, parameter. Let's say if you want to do temperature sensing, depending on what kind of application you're using, there will be so many conditions, you'll have to design it completely differently. Okay, so we'll go, go, go into that. But before that, we'll just go a little bit more in detail of like, you know, the different, uh, uh, like, you know, applications for, 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 for sensors. Like, for example, vehicles, right? Um, can somebody guess, like, on a, on a typical basis, how many sensors might be in, in, in a car? 20 to 30. 20 to 30, okay. According to data in my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are you just, like, counting? <laughs> Or like a 
Yeah, of people. course, yeah. Because, like, my car doesn't have the, uh, like, the infrared and stuff like that. That's for yeah. um, uh, uh, cruise control. Like, the newer cars mm-hmm. have um, yeah. like, automatic cruise control, but, like, my car doesn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, approximately 60 to 250. So the, the high-end cars, they have, like, almost 250 uh, sensors. Some of them may even have more. And, and as we uh, advance into self-driving cars, more and more sensors will be required. So it's a global market of $26 billion, right? Just sensors for, for uh, vehicles. So these are some of the, like, you know, just I, I pointed out some of the, like, you know, key sensors that are required. And as you will uh, notice, I, nowhere have I actually mentioned uh, all the like you know wide variety of sensors that you would need say for developing self uh, you know self driving cars so i'm i'm pretty sure in 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 the next decade or so that 250 will no longer be you know applicable probably be 1000 so i have every year i have to keep updating that particular slide at least <laughs> if not any other <laughs> okay so for space exploration right so we discussed uh, we want uh, sensors for that um so traditionally like you know Thousands of sensors have been incorporated in, in spaceships and all these things. Because, of course, you're spending so much money on building that, you need to make sure that everything is working accurately. But, uh, you know, no matter how good of a uh, like you know, rocket you make, ultimately it is handled by the astronauts, right? The people who are inside the, the shuttle and the people who are actually monitoring it uh, from, from, from Earth. So, so we need sensors to monitor their health as well. Um, and this is something that NASA has been thinking on since, since the beginning of the Apollo mission. So these are like, you know, one of the most earliest versions of wearable sensors that like, you know, NASA developed back in the, started developing back in the 1950s or so. So you can see electrocardiogram to understand how the heart is beating, a thermometer to take like, you know, the body temperature. Um, also blood pressure. So you can see all the, the key vital signs that are necessary to understand the human physiology. Uh, NASA had already developed these platforms. But can you see how, how cumbersome they look? Imagine your life already is miserable in that tiny shuttle. Okay? And then you have to wear all of these things and this, this temperature sensor is not a wearable sensor. It's actually like you know implanted inside you. Uh, to uh, monitor the temperature. So you have all of these additional things that you have to carry. And these are things that like, you know, NASA for es- especially is interested, how can we miniaturize these uh, without compromising on the quality of the data that you're acquiring? Um, yeah, so these are like, you know, more close up images of, of the sensors that I just showed. Another example is for poaching, you know, it's, it's almost like a $10 billion market. Of course, nobody knows the exact value of this because it's an illegal market. And it is just a, one statistic that I'm showing you. Is like in, in just 30 years, almost 90% of the black rhino population was killed. So there's, there's a lot of you know, interest to develop sensors that can help uh, minimize this, uh, you know, uh, this menace that, that uh, we face. So here are some of the examples that people are have developed, you know, what they do is they actually drill a hole and then they put cameras uh, and GPS systems, you know, around the neck and all these things. Can, can somebody point out the obvious flaws in this? Hmm? Exactly, yeah, you can see it. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it is really uncomfortable for the animal, that is one thing. But it, you can easily see it. I mean, uh, the, the, the poachers are not going to attack the animals that you already know are tagged. Right. So how can we make sensors that are like, you know, that are not so obvious. Right. So this is where, again, some of the nano micro sensing technologies can be of extreme use. And we will discuss uh, some of these examples later on in the class. I mean, not in this class, but future classes. We don't we won't cover everything in one. (laughs) So fine arts. Um, I'm not a a fine arts guy. I'll be very honest. Uh, So I was just trying to see how sensors are used in, in, in like, you know, in the fine arts field as well. So apparently there's a, uh, there was a very famous artist called Vermeer. I'm pretty sure some of you might know, but I did not. And um, so what happened is like in the earlier, uh, uh, in the mid 20th century, early 20th and mid 20th century, a lot of, like, you know, paintings of this guy started showing up. And it seemed as if like, you know, oh, wow, this is really great. We are seeing all of these art. 
turned out this guy was basically making fake art you know uh, under his under this guy's name and selling it and making like you know a lot of a lot of the uh, money apparently he also fooled some of the um, uh, highest hierarchies in in the nazi uh, you know uh, uh, yeah hierarchy i believe it was i don't re recollect who exactly he fooled but he fooled a lot of uh, people um also this is a very famous art D does anybody know the name of this painting it it is it is one of the most expensive uh paintings in the world so this this is a painting of uh jesus um uh, and it's called salvador mundi uh, and it is alleged that um uh, uh leonardo da vinci painted this but the but there's a lot of controversy going on saying like hey is this actually painted by leonardo or by one of his apprentices the reason is because most of the famous paintings by leonardo you know mona lisa and all the others apparently they they like the main uh, subject of the painting never looks directly at you they are always at an angle and this is apparently the only painting where the the main subject is looking directly at the viewer and this is why there's a lot of confusion like you know hey is this really the painting by da vinci i mean it's really difficult to know because if it were made by either the uh, da vinci or by his apprentice both are dead we know that for sure right? so so there is no way you you can interrogate anyone uh, to find that out so this is where senses could come into play you know uh, there are uh you know experts who use some of the like the most advanced technologies to understand like you know if a painting or if an art is uh, authentic or not or if uh, even if it is authentic what could be the approximate uh, like you know um, uh, period in which it, it was made so uh, so these these kind of technologies are like you know are extremely useful uh, in in understanding the authentication uh, of of arts Okay, so uh, I just kind of gave you uh, um, an overview of some of the uh, like you know importance of of these uh, like you know uh, sensors, and, and I purposely uh, like you know selected some of the examples that are like you know as unique as possible because everybody knows about variables and you know all these things. So I kind of wanted to go a little bit different. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, uh, we will focus on four types of sensors. Um, you know physical sensors and chemical sensors now you could argue that hey chemical sensors are also physical sensors i can touch them right uh, but but the the parameter that you are measuring okay it, it's like temperature you can't touch temperature right uh, and then like force and these are like physical parameters right so so that's why i kind of classify that them as physical sensors and chemical sensors are like you know catalytic and uh, affinity so these are like uh, sensors that will detect specific chemicals uh, in in the in specific sample um so let's take the uh, example of temperature sensors first so one of the earliest examples of a thermometer was this centauri back in uh, 1619 okay so they basically have a volatile gas uh, and then depending on the temperature the gas rises and goes down and then based on that you can estimate what is the temperature of course this is clearly like you know very delicate and not sen sensitive enough uh, and these are like you know some of the advanced versions that you can easily buy you know on amazon uh, if you want uh, like you know these are like contact probes non contact sensors uh, pretty pretty sensitive um but again like you know even though these sensors are sensitive there are a lot of applications where you can't really use them um and we will discuss some of these ap applications so again okay. coming back to space applications right um uh, uh, so this this is the space shuttle and this is the temperature um you know distribution on the surface of the space shuttle uh you know um and and you can see there's a there's a pretty dramatic variation between the temperature uh so this basically means that the materials that uh is used for making these shuttles they have to endure like you know really high temperatures but sudden change of temperature right the the same material this is the this is basically the the circumference of this this you know uh, capsule right 
So can someone tell me why would the temperature change so dramatically from one side to the other? You know, just a rough guess. Well, in space, it's basically like if you're in the sun, you get direct sun. But if you're in shadow, exactly. then you, are, you get no sun, you get no heat whatsoever. Exactly. So yeah. whatever, basically, what way you're facing the sun. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. So you, you have this region which is away from the uh, sun or any light source. Uh, and that's why this is cooler and this is at, at a high temperature. Now, the moment uh, the position change, uh, like, you know, the, the heat distribution will keep on changing, right? So, so this material is being exposed to these dramatic changes in, in temperature. Now, that's, you, you uh, answered that question perfectly. If I want to make sure that the material is homogeneously heated, right, because uh, Non-homogeneous heating is extremely uh, problematic, you know, uh, for, for the material's uh, uh, stability. So, homogeneously heated material would, would be preferable. I mean, one thing you would say that, oh yeah, we could incorporate some like, you know, coolers or something like that to cool down the material or something. But, I mean, in, in space, every pound that you carry, you have to think 100 times, like, it, I, I might, do I really, really want this, right? So if I want to have a homogeneous heating on the entire surface of my uh, uh, spacecraft, what could be done? This is not related to sensors, by the way, <laughs> but just, just, you know, just, uh, you know. The material, uh, the material should be a good conductor of heat so that it distributes it. Yeah, but then, like, you know, a lot of the good conductors of heat are also good conductors of uh, electricity, and that could be a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that could be one thing. And, and also, the thing is, um, it's not very easy to develop materials that already have to, that can handle that temperature um, and also make it, like, you know, uh, heat uh, conductive. So there are a lot of, like, you know, import, uh, things. What is the most simplest thing that you could do? Yeah, I mean, that is like the heat conduction, right? Yeah? Have something like a coating to reflect any light that would cause heat. So instead of be absorbing the heat, it would basically... Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that could be done. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Even simpler than that. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's one way to do it. <laughs> You could just make sure that your, uh, like, you know, uh, space shuttle is kind of, like, you know, rotating, right? So, gradually, it will just make sure that the heat distribution is uniform. Yeah, so, it's not just going straight, but it's kind of, like, you know, gradually rotating. Not, 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 like, super fast, but, like, you know, gradually rotating. Um, okay, then, um, as Kayla mentioned, industry. A lot of the, uh, like, you know, applications of sensors are in industry. So, for example, one of the industries that uh, I'm showing over here is for oil extraction. Now, here you have these, like, you know, pipes that go, like, you know, horizontally and could go as long as a kilometer long, you know. So, they are, like, really, really far from, from your, uh, the, the site which is actually at the surface, okay. And you need to measure the temperature at these locations because what you're doing is you're infusing high temperature fluids uh, and at uh, high pressures as well. So high pressure, high temperature, and usually you use, not usually, but always you'll use like really toxic chemicals because what you want to do is basically dissolve that material and extract that oil from it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an extremely dangerous, like, you know, uh, extreme conditions that uh, you want to develop sensors for. So as you can see, like, you know, it's the same temperature sensor, right? Be it for the wearable application, be it for the space or for the oil extraction, the parameter that you're measuring is the same, temperature. But e for each and every application, the conditions are different and you have to design it accordingly, right? So, uh, for, for example, in case of, let's say, the wearable application, you could just have, like, you know, some sort of like a sensor that's sticking on your skin and then, you know, it's transmitting through your cell phone or something like that, right? But here, your sensor is going to be like, let's say like, you know, 500 meters, one kilometer away from, from your, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever, like, you know, station that you have. So your sensors have to be able to be able to treat like, you know, remotely as well. 
you know so these are the conditions not to mention all the chemicals and the uh, you know high pressure that uh, the sensors will be uh, experiencing another key example very topical for like you know uh, for present scenario is uh, battery runoff like you know the battery is getting heating heated up and then like just exploding right so if you could incorporate some tiny micro sensors within the battery setup okay so that the moment the temperature goes beyond a certain limit you know it basically shuts the battery off something like that would be very useful and this is something that like you know a lot of the companies are working on to make sure that this this thing never happens and the terrible thing about these uh, battery fires is you can't really uh, extinguish it very easily um, there have been a lot of cases where you know several hours the fire extinguishers have spent their time trying to douse the fire and then the fire reignites after two days after two days <laughs> so so these are, these are like some really dangerous fires okay let's take the case of some pressure sensors now uh, these are some some of the most like you know common pressure sensors that you will see in the market if you want to go and buy some pressure sensor there will be some capacitive sensors piezoelectric sensors now you will ask me what what does that even mean how does that like you know what is the working principle of these sensors don't worry we'll be covering that in the in the next uh, like you know in the future classes this is just just a very very brief idea you know uh, of of the kind of sensors that are there so we will really discuss how, how how these work what is the difference between the, what are the pros and cons of this sensor compared to this one and what could be the applications for these ones and what how distinct are they from 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 these piezoelectric ones okay so some of the ex examples could be augmented reality a lot of interest in that be it for gaming applications what other applications could be, could it be for for say augmented reality are, are, are there any other like sure i understand the gaming part but is there is there any other application that one could think of for augmented reality other than augmented reality hmm? you mean other than augmented yeah, I mean, um, I mean, or yeah. do, you, do you mean like different types of augmented reality? Sure, yeah, yeah. Don't they have um, some medical programs mm -hmm. use uh, VR um, with like stuff like that for instead of having a cadaver to work on, you would actually, it's like a totally virtual, yeah. but you, you have that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's a re really good example where, you know, you, you could uh, virtually work on something and get actual feel of how it is going to be in real life. The other options could also be for bi some uh, direct biomedical applications where the doctor may be in one location, but the patient is in completely different. And let's say you want to do some, uh, you know, uh, there are a certain uh, lumps or something like that, and the, the doctor wants to like you know, literally touch it and feel it or like you know to see how it is so for these kind of applications you know these kind of systems can be of, of great use um, also for prosthetics um, wh why, why would we need pressure sensors for prosthetics for example artificial skin like mm -hmm. we can have um, like we can represent like if we touch our own skin we will feel the pressure but with the pressure sensor, it can get this artificial skin and like a little feel. Mm -hmm. as well. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good. Another yeah, okay. slightly different application is uh, when you uh, actually have a prosthetic leg or hand, let's say, attached to your actual amputated leg. So there are certain spots that have high, that, mm -hmm. that experience high sense uh, pressure and cause discomfort to the mm -hmm. wearer. So uh, some of the sensors, like one of the sensors I know, um, they have these textile-based sensors they place between the, at the interface so yeah. that detects. So that helps to optimize uh, the structure of the artificial leg metal, in a metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. A, in a more exterior sense, like if you're climbing up the stairs or like the, the, the road or whatever you're walking on is not very, what do you call, uniform, but you're not able to see somehow it can sense it and based on that it will help you balance your uh, posture mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so these are like you know all all the uh, great examples uh, of these like you know bio integrated uh, for for various bio integrated applications. Uh, the other one that we, we talked about is for infrastructure monitoring, right? So this this happened in in 2020 where um, 13 people died because uh, a, a building collapsed. Um, so it's very difficult to know in advance when a particular building or an like you know an infrastructure system is going to just collapse, right? And and when they do, they can have some really bad consequences. So if, uh, we, if we can integrate some of these pressure sensors, we know there are certain locations that are usually high, like, you know, a high susceptibility, uh, susceptible uh, to uh, pressure loads. So if we can integrate some of these sensors, you know, uh, you may be able to monitor uh, the infrastructure in, in a real time basis. And, and people have been working on these kind of sensors, but can, can, can someone, um, uh, you know, um, Tell me what, what would be the key requirements for such kind of you know sensors? What would be the key requirement? Let's say just just focus on, on pressure sensors. Uh, for infrastructure. Yeah, for infrastructure. Need to be environmentally yeah, yeah. You you would want it to survive for <laughs> for a long long duration. You don't want it to just it should be able to warn the person as in whoever is in charge that it's going to happen like long before like people should have mm -hmm. the time to actually uh, look forward to like how to retain the building rather than like it's collapsing so it should mm -hmm. be that, that amount of time for the right. action to be taken yeah so you need to have like really sensitive sensors um, also a lot of these uh, you know let's say a dam or a, or a, or a building or a, or a bridge right there's already a lot of vibrations and motions and all these things taking place. Right? Let's, say take, let's take the case of, 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 a, of, of a bridge. Cars are going on it and, and a lot, a lot of, at least sometimes you, you may have experienced that you know when uh, the cars are moving the, the bridge actually shakes. Right? I mean they, they purposely design it in that, in that way. Right? So you need to design these, these sensors that are, so that you don't get false signals because of these kind of things. Right, so you have to make sure that they are able to survive the extreme weather that that they will be experiencing. Um, let's say it's built in Chicago. You know, it's extremely cold during winters, pretty hot in the in the, uh, in the during the summer. So you have these extreme, you know, uh, temperature uh, changes that that could affect. What what could be the other, uh, you know, key requirement? So so we discussed high sensitivity. We discussed. The importance of environment. What else did we discuss? Um, did we discuss anything else? Uh, the, like the longevity of the sensor is supposed like the validation phase of a sensor needs to survive the usage of the like infrastructure or the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What What else could be the the need? Uh, the requirement. It has to be not easily integratable into the building, but it has to have some level of ease to where yeah. any you don't need a special key person to come and put this in your building. Whoever's building the building should be able to use it and operate it and install it correctly. Yeah, that, that is an extremely important point, right? Because, okay, if you're building a new uh, thing, then okay, you might be able to, like, you know, integrate your systems. But it's not very really easy to build new stuff anyway. So you may you may want to develop system that can be easily integrated on existing infrastructure without a lot of you know cost overruns and all these things, right? And also um, uh, the other thing would be uh, just again just like the uh, oil extraction example, right? The sensing node, the the location where you are actually doing the sensing, may be pretty far from where your center like you know the monitoring center is so again remote sensing is going to be key yeah so these are like you know just an example here what they are doing is they have a fiber optic sensor um and um unlike what kayla was pointing out that like you know if we can integrate it on existing infrastructure that would be great but as of most of these are actually uh, being developed for something that you can 
incorporate while the new structures are being built. Uh, so they are basically putting these fibers within the 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 in, uh, the the build, uh, the structure that that they are building. Uh, but but the key is to make something that can be integrated later on as well. So again, don't worry about how the fiber optic sensor works. Again, we will discuss these things later on. But just just. Uh, just I have a sure. Sorry. Uh, what is the scale of that fiber? You said fiber, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the scale yeah, that's a good question. I, to be honest, I don't know <laughs> the I exact think scale. Is it big? Is it like small? Is it... Oh, it, it, the, these uh, usually the fibers are pretty thin. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, these fiber optic sensors will work only if the these fibers are pretty thin. Uh, again, we'll discuss why that is important. But I, I'm guessing these are probably less than a millimeter wide. So the, the, the core, okay, now they, they put this extra cladding material on top of it just to make it insensitive to other stuff that may be happening around it, okay. Uh, but the, the core, uh, this core uh, thing, right, this part, uh, sorry, uh, this, this, this part, center part, mm -hmm. that is pro probably less than a millimeter, it could be even thinner. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like, some of the thinnest ones are probably, like, uh, one micron thin, so like really, really thin, and that's why you can get like really high sensitivity uh, sensing. So here uh, I, I show an example of a patient. So this is like a real life, uh, like a you know, real life uh, uh, example. So there was this patient who had this intense headaches uh, and migraines. Okay, um, and uh, like you know later on that was uh, in, in in addition to that she, she also had hearing and vision problems. Now. The, the 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 attending uh, physician mischaracterized the situation and then gave her uh, you know a, a, a prescription of antibiotics and and other you know cocktail uh, medications and that actually aggravated the situation okay and it turned out that like you know um, whatever the doctor had diagnosed or thought like you know is the situation was not the case and and what she had is idiopathic intracranial hypertension now one would ask what the heck that is <laughs> so basically what happens is uh in just uh, like inside the skull you have the brain but the brain is not like you know um it's actually surrounded by this fluid okay just uh, for protecting um and and also for um uh, like you know for uh, for uh, neurochemical communication so you have this fluid that is there present between the skull and and the brain okay uh, so what happens is there is some space for if the brain expands for some medical uh, because of some medical conditions if it expands the skull is able to accommodate some expansion of the brain okay but for some reason if it expands too long too much then what happens is the fluid starts uh, like you know exerting a lot of pressure onto the brain and, and the skull, okay? So just imagine as, as a small box and you have a balloon in it, right? And if, if that balloon expands, the air that is there between the, the, the container and the balloon, right? That is going to be experiencing a lot of pressure, right? So because of this, this high pressure, the, the patient was experiencing uh, intense headaches and, and, and migraines. And, and the terrible thing is it has the same uh, you know, uh, symptoms as a brain tumor. Okay, so it's really difficult to know: is it is it a tumor, or is it this uh, IIH? I will just call it IIH. Okay, so is is it that or this? So symptoms are the same. So one way to know is they actually implant these micro probes of of, of the, the, these micro probes of sensors inside, like they basically drill a hole in the skull and they put a pressure sensor inside to measure what the pressure is. And if they uh, notice that the pressure is higher than the physiological range, they will actually like, you know, draw out some of the fluid. So these are the kind of things like, you know, uh, people do. Um, so yeah, you can see like, you know, here it is basically measuring the, the pressure values. So again, requirement for a pressure sensor. Sensor, the, the parameter that you're measuring is the same, but the requirements are completely different. And, and and in almost all the cases, the working principle of the sensors will also be the same. They will either be piezoelectric or capacitive, or maybe some other form of, of, of sensor. Uh, I mean, there are some optical sensors as well. 
uh, but the, the the key working principles may be just like you know two or three for you to play with okay ultimately depends on how you design it uh, what kind of materials you use and all these things right okay so uh, switching gears now from uh, physical sensors to chemical sensors and as we discussed we'll be talking about catalytic sensors and and affinity sensors uh, if you or anybody you know has ever done a blood test uh, that person's blood has been analyzed by either a like you know a bench top uh, system like this a clinical analyzer to test all the different types of metabolites electrolytes proteins and all the other stuff um, or or uh, like you, you may even know someone uh, who does a regular blood uh, glucose monitoring you know using a handheld uh, system you can see that the system is so different but if you really uh, like you know break it down to see what the working principles are their working principle is the same for 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 uh, for most of it. Uh, I, I grant you that this one measures only glucose this can measure a whole host of things but if you just take the glucose sensor part for that is incorporated in this system the working principle is going to be the same but the form factor is very different um one of the applications we all know we discussed this uh, you know, earlier disease management uh, fitness monitoring these are like you know some of the examples um but then like you know um one of the new applications that again we are very familiar with are these variable non-invasive sensors so it could be on the skin people have also developed that like you know you could put these micro sensors in in, in between the eyelid and the eye um, and uh, you, you can monitor the tear blood glu uh, tear glucose levels and this this cool device uh, actually developed at nc state you know uh, and it can monitor multiple parameters in the sweat uh, as well as um, uh, gases that are present in, in the environment. So as you can see, uh, NC State already has a well-established, you know, center just for these kind of, like, you know, novel technologies. Um, okay, so moving on from, you know, measuring the person at the person level <laughs> and, and all the way down to single cells, okay? Now, there's a lot of, uh, like, you know, cellular machinery that happens within the within a single cell you know a, a, a single cell which is maybe like you know a few uh, hundred microns maybe you know or, or even lower than that so there's a lot of stuff that happens within the cell okay and this is just one of the physiological pathways that i'm showing over here and there are like so many other so you would also want to know what is happening inside each cell right if you want to understand what are the uh, intracellular processes occurring? What could be the application of understanding that? You know, why, 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 why do I care what is happening inside one single cell? Like maybe cancer is happening? Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, because th these things happen inside the cell. Right? So you would want to see what happens. Um, and also for uh, like, not just for detection, but also for understanding, say, if you developed a new uh, drug, right? How is that affecting on, on individual cells? You know, uh, is there something that is, it, is it having the positive effect that you are hoping for? Or is it having the positive effect, but also some other unwanted effects on the cells, right? So these, all these things, you need a sensor that can go actually inside the cell uh, and, and, and capture the, do, those signals. So here I show, show one example. So this is a fluorescence-based lactate sensor, so inside cancer cells. So these are cancer cells, and if they have, if they are producing lactate, they will start glowing uh, when they are, uh, you know, shine uh, by, by light. So this is one way. The other way is you actually have these thin wire type electrodes that can actually pierce through the walls of the cells and then go inside and then measure the chemical inside it. So this is more invasive because you're actually piercing. And th these are like, you know, pretty non-invasive because what happens is these probes are so tiny that they can actually go through the, uh, the, the cell wall and, and inside the cell and then produce signals. 
Okay, so these are like you know some some of the two examples, and both both these technologies are developed using nano micro technology, and and we'll discuss that how how this is done. Um, also, like you know, diseases, you know, uh, tuberculosis, uh, ten million cases, um, and sadly, uh, almost I believe quarter of those cases, or even more than quarter of those cases, are from India, where I, I come from. So tuberculosis is a big problem, and the biggest problem with tuberculosis is the mutant versions of it, it which which are not easily treated with existing uh, uh, you know um, medications that are there. So there is there is a lot of interest in making sure that we are able to detect uh, this as soon as possible, so it can be treated, so it does not like you know mutate into newer forms that that may be more problematic. Um, HIV is another an, a, another case where, like you know, the technology that is used is basically like you know these chemical sensors in the form of affinity sensors. Now, don't worry about what is a catalytic sensor, what is an affinity sensor. We will discuss all of this in the, in, in, in future. But just 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 bear with me for 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 now. Um, so as, as you can see, um, like you know, so if if I go back here, you know. Um, most of the cases in developing countries with poor uh, he uh, health, uh, you know, facilities. Same is the case with HIV. Most of the cases in uh, poor uh, countries. So, this basically means we have to develop sensors that can be easily, you know, uh, sent to these places that do probably do not have good electricity. Certainly, do not have the advanced healthcare facilities like the US and the other uh, like you know western countries have so the 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 need is as simple sensor as possible but at the same time as accurate as possible you cannot compromise on the accuracy you do not want uh, a person who actually has the disease to be mis uh, diagnosed saying that oh you don't have don't worry about it right you really don't want that situation to happen and same is the case with a person who is not having that disease to let them know that oh you probably have that disease that that's also a terrible situation uh, to be in so that that that's like you know you you certainly need sensors that are highly highly sensitive covid i'm pretty sure everybody over here has heard of and has certainly done pcr test antigen test what is that you know and I mean, what is the difference between the two? What does antigen testing mean? What does PCR, RT-PCR sensing mean? You have joined the right course. I'll teach you what, what the difference between the two types of sensors are, what are the pros and cons of the two sensors, and why one takes a, a really short time while the other takes a lot more time, but it is more accurate. So I, we'll discuss all of these things. So. Uh, one of the cases I kind of wanted to discuss was, I mean, I actually can design an entire class on just on this guy. His name is uh, Joseph Henry Loveless. So this is a very famous case. It took 103 years for this case to uh, to be solved. Now this guy's history is amazing. I mean, like you know, if you just go and and read about this guy, this guy is like you know a complete, you know, like the the bad guy from from. Uh, you know the, the way they show in the movies this is that kind of a guy so he was killed somewhere in the 1916 and it took 103 years to solve the case and the only reason why they were able to solve the case was because of the DNA technology and the sensors that are that are like you know, available in, in today's world and that was the only reason why they were never able to solve the case same is the case with this this guy um, Again, it took 17 years to basically identify the, the, this guy. So, you know, you can see how uh, these sensors are having immediate impact on, on, on like, you know, in, in our lives. So I'm going to uh, quickly switch to gas sensors. Uh, just FYI, we won't be covering gas sensors. I may put in one or two examples, uh, you know, depending on how the class turns out. Uh, but I kind of wanted to just discuss this, you know, because this is also an important class of sensors. So everybody, or, or at least somebody, must have heard of the canary in the coal mine, right? Does anybody know what that even means, stands for? Well, I, I know the story of it. Oh, okay, well. Uh, 
Um, so basically, back in the days, what they would do is they would take um, into the coal mines, um, you know, West Virginia, Montana, you know, out west. They're in the middle of nowhere. And they would bring canaries, usually, down with them into the mines, and they would usually put them down farther than where they would work, because they would continuously like tweet. You know, they would make noises. But if there was a gas leak or something, you you know, down there, there the gases are going to kill you fairly quickly. And if it went silent, they knew to get out because it killed the bird. So there's a gas leak. So you need to get out. Um, and that's, that's why they use Yeah. So, so many reasons why we should not use that technology. <laughs> you know? <laughs> for, for, first of all, it's unethical. The other reason is you don't want to risk your life on a bird. Right? Uh, and also, uh, like, what, what if one bird is more sensitive than the other bird? You know, there, there are so many factors that, that, that can affect the output of this innovative sensor, right? So, clearly that was not the way to do. Back in the days, it was all right, I guess. Uh, but now, uh, there are these advanced sensors that can monitor a whole host of sen uh, like you know, chemicals, uh, gases, in a, in a very uh, highly sensitive way without killing any birds. Uh, so, some of the examples, wearable sensors, just two applications. One is just to understand how your body is behaving. So by by monitoring the the gases that you're exhaling, you can understand if your uh, like you know it, what is your overall physiological state. I mean, there are some very interesting cases where they have shown that just by monitoring the breath le uh, gas levels, one could differentiate between a cancer patient and a healthy patient. Um, and there are a lot of these, like, you know, small s studies that people have done to show that these kind of sensors can be used as a rapid screening approach. Uh, but also for pollution monitoring, you know, not just inside, but outside, surrounding, what is surrounding you. Um, just because everything, uh, like, you know, just because when I'm walking, everything looks clear, that doesn't mean that it, it is a safe environment. There could be some toxic gases that my nose may not be able to detect that easily. But these sensors... Uh, will be able to. And some of the examples where you really push the limits of these gas sensors would be extreme low temperatures, where the temperatures could be like, you know, really, really low. So how would the, these sensors behave in such extreme conditions? Now here, at least you are on Earth. So you have an atmosphere, which is the, 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 all the sensors that mankind has developed are for, <laughs> for you know, uh, 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 for for terrestrial applications, so you could use those sensors with some modifications. But here, the the environment is so different. So the uh, the gas composition is different. There's a lot of dust that is there. So these gas sensors can be easily uh, get affected because of these like you know dust that is all around the place. So there are a lot of lot of conditions that that need to be uh, thought about if you want to develop sensors for these kind of emerging applications. So, um, where does all this nano micro stuff fit in? Right, All the sensors that I've shown you, right, all the photos, you could easily see with your eyes. So what does that mean? Do you have like, like scanning electron microscopy like eyes where like, you know, these, you can see these tiny things or was I just fooling you guys by showing all these big sensors and calling them na nano micro, right? So, Whenever people think about nano micro, they think about oh these futuristic, you know, miniaturized uh, systems and uh, robots that can do really fancy things, right? You know, you have this big, big machine. You just think that oh you can somehow shrink it, and that that's that's the nano micro technology. If if you have joined the class for understanding how to make this, I'm I'm really sorry. I'm going to be uh, d disappointing you, but we are nowhere close to having anything like this. Okay, nowhere close. So this is not what we will be discussing. What we will be discussing is how these nano and micro materials and how these nano micro processing of the materials can be used for making a sense, uh, like, you know, systems. So you know, here I show this one. So this is a, a, an array of sensors 
Now, individual sensors are in the micron range. Okay. Now here, this is a cantilever. Uh, do you know what a cantilever is? So basically, cantilever is, as you can see here, a very thin plank which is attached to a, uh, you know, a, a surface. So just like a plank, if you just, uh, you know, flip it, so it will just like you know keep vibrating, and depending on the dimensions. It will resonate at a specific, uh, you know, frequency, depending on the dimension. So, so these are the kind of sensors that people have developed. So these are these are in the so this one certainly the nano tubes, as the name suggests, is is in the nano range. But these are these are in the micron ranges. Now, even if somehow you know I'm able to make these sensors, not somehow, but people have made it. The point is, if something is happening over here, how will you even know? Right? I mean, how will you know? I mean, I have this, let's say, a single nano wire, okay, a wire or, or this micro cantilever that is there. If some chemical reaction takes place or something happens there, how are you going to get information from it? That is not possible. You, you need some system where you can actually see or feel uh, so to know, right? For example, if you, if you have a blood glucose meter, you need a big screen so you can clearly see what the, the actual value is. So even though certain parts of your sensor may be in the nano micro, ultimately the, the, the display units and the, uh, the signals, uh, the system that are used to capture the signals from these sensors may be much bigger. Okay, so th these are the things that like, you know, we will be talking about the importance of nano micro sensors for enhancing the signals or for incorporating capabilities that are not possible when you use like big bigger uh, you know form factors but ultimately the system will be uh, fairly big so for example over here uh, this is a, a rapid test for uh, 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 covid 19 you, you can see again don't worry about how this thing works just think that if the antigen for the virus is is there then the color will change from ruby red to kind of pink color okay so just by visually seeing the color change uh, you'll be able to estimate whether that person had has that antigen in that uh, in, the, in the blood or, or or whichever sample they are analyzing now technically this color change is actually occurring at the nanometer range okay but if you just have two particles that are nanometer and if they change the color, you won't be able to see. They are so small. So you will need a lot of this solution. So this solution is basically filled with these uh, nanoparticles. So you need a lot of this to actually visu visually see. Same is the case over here as well. So instead of just visual color change, these are um, quantum dots. Again, uh, you know, few nanometers in, in dimensions. Depending on the chemical, it changes color, uh, uh, the, the fluorescence intensity. So you can m measure these things as well. Um, again, like, you know, uh, it's not just for, for sensing applications, but also for handling fluid. Uh, if, if you have, like, say, blood sample, and if you want to purify the blood sample before analysis, so a lot of, uh, like, you know, advances in the microfluidics. So basically the, handling the fluids at really small volume, because when you do a blood test, you don't want to pro give like, I don't know, like hundreds of milliliters of blood, right? You want to give a very small amount of fluid and you want to acquire as much data as possible. That that would be the, that was basically the selling point of Theranos. <laughs> so I'm not trying to teach you technology of Theranos because that doesn't exist. But uh, the, the goal is to take as small amount of blood or any fluid and get as much data as possible. That's where fluidics is going to come into play. Again, these are things that I'll discuss in, 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 my, uh, in my future class. Um, and also like, you know, this, the, these nano micro materials can be used for making materials that are not possible at a bulk, bulk stage. Like for example, how can you make say soft stretchable uh, sensors that can integrate on the skin? So there, a lot of these micro and nano materials are used for making these stretchable circuits, uh, you know, something that you can wrap, something that even can self-heal. So if you stretch it, if it breaks, it will have some uh, incorporated 
mechanisms that it will self heal just like the human skin you know if if it if there is a cut eventually it heals by itself right so people are using nano micro technology for developing these kind of artificial skin electronics as well that can self heal yeah so next class i think we are on time oh maybe a, a little bit over time so in next class what we will discuss is the the key components of of a sensor okay what are the key components and um, how to differentiate them and because this will be important whenever you see a sensor you should be able to do, identify these are the key components and if you understand the key components then it becomes much easier to understand how that sensor works okay uh, any questions no? okay either i did a good job or i did a terrible i don't know which one it is <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to set that up. So for now, what I'll do is I'll just email these slides to all of you. I, I kind of still need to set, set that up. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just, just email these slides. Will, will that work for you guys for now? Yeah. yeah. OK, cool. So just a quick question. Um, like, do people do like you know attendance or anything like that in class or no? Or maybe you guys are not the right person. There's conflict of interest here. <laughs> <laughs> I should ask. <laughs> I mean, I know in Dr. Lee's class last semester, we had like a whole attendance like one day. Okay. But he announced it like for the class, like ahead. At least I think he did ahead of time. Okay. That like, hey, taking attendance this one class will be like okay. Like, okay. I'll, I'll confirm that with Michael. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he had to. Like his, I mean, his classes are different. Yeah. Um, it's not a 500. It's cross-listed. So mm -hmm. I don't know if he's prior to take at least one attendance. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I see. Okay. I just okay. created for him. I didn't ask him. Okay. Else. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'll see you guys on Thursday. Oh, you're, you're working on animals? Yeah, I'm oh. continuing on with it. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, ah, I can't escape it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always challenging working with those guys. <laughs> yeah. See you. See you. Thank you. Thank you.